Alrighty, good afternoon. Um, so today I'm going to take you through a story uh, of the, uh, the genesis, the present, and what I see is the future of, of crowdsourced security, vulnerable disclosure, and, and bug bounties. Um, bug Crowd actually pioneered the bug bounties a platform model when we launched our first program in, uh, in 2012. And really what we've seen since then is a, is a ton of different learnings, a ton of different understandings, a ton of different things that people are getting from the model on both sides of the equation, uh, ranging from the technology companies that are most probably represented here today, right through to healthcare, automotive, retail, and so on. So we've learned a bit. I'm going to share some of that, and hopefully it's helpful. Let's begin. So first things first, what is a bug bounty program? It's essentially a contest where a group of security researchers are invited to come in and find and report security vulnerabilities in a set of targets. The first to find each unique issue is the one who gets paid, and the more critical the issue is, the more that person gets paid. Think of it as a vulnerability disclosure program, but with an incentive to actually direct behavior to particular outcomes. It's interesting how this all came about. The first uh, documented technology uh, bug bounty program was actually Netscape, and uh, one of the uh, the cool things that I get to do as a as a founder here in the Bay Area is is meet people like this guy. This is Jeff Truhaft, who was one of the engineers that actually worked on that program, and we got to talking about why they did it. Um, what it came down to is when they were working on the software packages that they were building very early on in the piece, they started putting them on the, on the internet, and lo and behold, people came along and started hacking them. Right. And that was because they didn't know, you know how to find bugs at that point. Like the state of security software at that stage uh, in, in the internet was, was you know, in its absolute infancy. But what they realized was it's not just about their product. I think that's the way that people think about it mostly today. At that stage, the internet was like a baby. So this was literally about protecting the future of the internet itself. To me, that showed tremendous foresight. Like not only did it work for them, um, but it set us up really well for today. Like today, what we've got is active, efficient adversaries. We've got a growing attack surface. We're taking everything that we can think of and putting it on the internet. We've got an incredible skill shortage. You know, 370,000 people, I think, in the US, according to the Bureau of Labor at this point. And then we've got a broken status quo. And by that, I mean we're paying people by the hour when, they, when it comes to vulnerability discovery and expecting them to be able to com creatively compete on an ongoing basis with a crowd of adversaries that have got lots of different skill sets, lots of different motivations, and more of a motivation for results than a constraint around effort. And when it comes to automation, I've loved the, uh, the two talks that have, that have gone before, and I think there's incredible leverage for humans to get from, from machine learning, AI, and just general automation. But the reality is by the time a computer is as creative as a human, we're going to be dealing with Skynet, and we probably won't be too worried about vulnerability discovery anymore. We'll have other things to think about. This is an intractably human problem. So meanwhile, in the middle of all of these growing forces, we've got this incredible group of white hat hackers that have been sitting out there for you know, the better part of 30 years wanting to come to the table and actually help out. But we haven't really you know, extended the invitation to them. So. We did. This is what happened. You know, the growth of bug bounty adoption over time, you've got the, uh, the Netscape program there. You fast forward a little bit, you've got the Google and the Facebook and the, uh, the Etsy programs that, that actually made the concept quite popular. It was what brought my attention to the model. Um, we launched in 2012 as Bug Crowd and started figuring out ways to appropriate this model to the broader market. And then it's really gone from there. What we've seen since. And it was really always our thesis, is that this is not just a, a crazy Bay Area uh, tech company thing to do. It's actually something that solves a problem that the entire market, everyone that's building software, has. So now to the present. To get to where we are today, the model had to answer a few very important questions for the demand side. Is it safe? It's a question I get asked all the time. It's a question I'm seeing nodding heads right now. So it's a question some of you probably have as well. Who are these people? Who's hacking my applications and systems? What kind of results can I expect? And how much time will it take for me to manage? I'm constrained as a security team as it is. How do I not have this overburden my already pretty stressed out, stretched out team? Um, I'll respond to some of those questions through the, uh, through the next section here. Another bug crowd thesis is that you know, this would augment, this model would augment, and in some cases replace current security assessments right across the market. So what we set about doing was carving up 
the core bug bounty model to appropriate it into different formats, right? And what we've seen since is those models have become generally adopted across the industry. So when you think about vulnerability disclosure programs, that's more of a neighborhood watch. For, uh, it's a see something, say something for the internet. You're, you're going out and extending an invitation for people to find and report to you issues that they observe. Without an incentive, though. You're just telling them, hey, if you find something, here's how you can tell us. The public bug bounty program is the one that we're probably most aware of in this room, because it's the noisiest, right? That's like the Facebook program. You know, more recently, some of the, uh, some of the larger organizations that have, uh, have done these programs out on the East Coast and, and from more traditional verticals have made it even louder. But the part that people don't tend to know too much about is you know, the concept of running a, a bug bounty program privately. So taking the knowledge, actually engaging someone like us uh, or someone who has information, or even doing it yourself if you've got a decent posse of hackers that you can actually reach out and, and attract, and running the same model but on a private basis, which gives you a lot more control and, and so forth. And then the fourth is really extending the concept to basically end up with a, a situation where you can have hackers on demand. So you're, you're accessing, you're actually overcoming the labor shortage by going out, grabbing people, bringing them in for this type of work. You know, that's where we're seeing this actually crossover with some forms of pen testing. Not all of it, but some forms of it. Yeah, and as I said, these are now becoming fairly commonly accepted as you know, variants of the bug bounty model. So when people say bug bounty, it's not necessarily always the same thing that they're talking about. <clears throat> TLDR, it, it really works. Bug bounty uh, programs are a logical solution for this issue, and you know, the proof is the incredibly quick adoption across all industries. Um, you can see from this graph, the blue is the public programs that we launched, the, the frequency of that. And then when we started running private programs, and introducing them to the more conservative markets that weren't ready, frankly, for a public bug bounty program, but weren't you know, terribly excited about the idea of throwing open the doors to the internet and inviting people to hack them. They're not at that point of maturity or understanding yet. That took off. <clears throat> What's interesting is um, you know, the adoption of this model, like that's, that's in line with what I was saying before about our thesis of this coming in and actually cutting into some of the traditional security assessment models that are out there. People are looking to improve the status quo. They're looking to find new ways to, to you know, reduce their risk more cost effectively on top of what they've already done or in, alongside it. <clears throat> and here's you know, an answer to the results question. So it really, really works. This is a, a public case study from, from Aruba. Um, they've published all of this and quite proudly so because I think what they've done is realized that vulnerabilities happen. Like we're talking about you know, creative output of humans that are writing code and cutting attack surface. Humans are as powerful as they are fallible. So vulnerabilities are going to happen. The trick is to create this build up, break a feedback loop, and learn from each other and try to get better as you go along. This is an example of that. And the interesting thing to call out is that at the start of this, all of the, uh, the products and platforms that are in this program have all been through Red Team, they've all been through static code analysis, they've all been through you know, all of the different automations and internal processes uh, that they have before the crowd got to them. And really, it was the diversity of skill. It's this incredible, like, powerful, beautiful community of people that are ready to help, and the different mindsets and the different skills that they bring to the table that actually made it all work. So it's pretty phenomenal. In terms of who they are, it's pretty interesting to see where folk are coming from. We've, we've done a bunch of surveys over the years for our own knowledge and for, for marketing and education to, to answer that question because we get asked a lot by folk. You know, the majority of people that, we have, uh, that we're seeing actually operate on these programs are pen testers. They're, they're doing security work. And what they're doing is they're using bug bounty programs or vulnerable disclosure programs to either augment their income um, or to context switch. They're looking to, to compete. They're looking, looking to join in the game, uh, build out their resume, learn new skills, do all of those different things. This is actually available for download online. I can see a few people taking photos there. But feel free to do that, but you can, uh, you can grab the whole thing as well. Um, a lot of them have uh, higher education. And this is global. This is not just the researchers that we're seeing come in from the US. Like, the second biggest population on the bug crowd platform right now is India, and then it's UK, Australia, Germany, and then basically other. And the commonality is that a lot of them are, are college graduates. So they've learned either engineering or computer security in college, and now they're appropriating to, uh, to this type of model, which is 
pretty cool to see. Really, the point to call out here is that the vast majority of the people that we're seeing actually engage with this, and this is representative of, what, of what's happening right across the board, by the way. They're actually professionals. They're jumping in to extend, as I said, their skill set or to make a bit of cash on the side. Or if they're in a country that, that um, allows you know, the purchase power parity is such that the rewards are even more significant to them, they can subsist off it as well. And we're seeing that increase as well. So this is where <clears throat> I think this is the, the takeaway section. Um, this is the part that I really wanted to, to get to because I, I believe very strongly, and I'll get to this in a second, that this model, if you're in any kind of security management role or touching any sort of security management function, you're going to have to figure out how to interact with a researcher community at some point over your career. Because what's happening is this. There's pressure coming from all sides on, on basically having organizations throw the doors open to, to security researchers, actually take, the, take it from being a hostile relationship to one that's inviting, that has terms around it and has control, um, but is welcoming, right? And when you think about it, it's, it's from really three directions. It's from the top legislative. One of the first questions that the House Committee asked Equifax was, do you have a vulnerability disclosure program after they got breached, right? It's just been written into NIST. There's all sorts of different things happening top down. From the bottom up, it's interesting because this sense of consumer social responsibility, you know, corporate grading, like this whole idea of being able to compare organizations against another for the sake of their safety rating, their cyber safety and security rating, that's getting traction. And the other interesting thing about this model is that my grandma understands it. We're not talking about, you know, space age tech here. If I go to my, you know, someone who's not an internet hardcore technician and say, this is like neighborhood watch for the internet, you're like, oh, okay, that's a good idea. So that's driving pressure from the bottom up. And then the third is lateral. So if you think about it, if there's five big banks in a vertical or in, an, in a region, two of them run a, a disclosure program of some sort, and the other three don't, all of a sudden those three are being called to account. And we're seeing all of these things happen, particularly around vulnerability disclosure. Like what I predict will happen is that uh, vulnerability disclosure will go from being the thing that you're unusual if you do, to the thing that you're unusual if you don't do, sometime over the next 12 or 18 months driven by the convergence of these pressures. With bug bounty programs and with crowdsource security, all that other stuff, that's more optional. I think that's more economically driven and driven by risk, but this thing is something to definitely pay attention to. So, how do you get it right? And this is some story time. So, Crawl Walk Run. Um, we, one of the first bounty programs that we ran was for a, uh, a organization that basically raised money and ran initiatives to combat sex trafficking in Southeast Asia. They didn't have any cash to pay us, but we thought, you know what, let's go out and actually invite people to hack it and we'll see, we'll see, like, we'll create charity points or whatever. It might not even work, it was fully caveated with them, and keep in mind this was like the second or third program that we ran, so we've learned a lot since, right? We basically knocked them off the internet. Um, the, the response and the, um, and the feedback from the community was so strong, there was all of these you know, submissions coming in, all these people saying, yeah, I'm really excited to be working on this program, but it actually knocked them over at the end of the day. So that's what I mean by crawl, walk, run. You need to assess your resiliency, make sure that your internal systems, your internal remediation pathways, your team is prepared to be able to ramp this up. And the best way to do that is start privately and then ramp up over time. Tip one, align expectation. A really good example, uh, or a really good recent example of where this didn't work is the DJI bug bounty, um, where essentially they came out of the gate very fast, said, all right, here's a half thought through brief, had a bunch of researchers get really excited about it, do some good faith research, and then they started changing the brief because they, they didn't like what was going on. That whole thing blew up, became a huge PR nightmare. There's a ton of learnings from that, I think uh, Amit Elazari is going to talk about some of them tomorrow, so I suggest I recommend that talk. Um, but really what it comes down to, the secret to a successful program is aligning expectations, making commitments that you can follow through on, and then always following through on them. That takes a bit of planning, but once you get it in place, it just works. Communication. Speak openly and often. 
make sure that the communication pathways are aligned amongst all of the stakeholders. An example of where this has gone a little funky uh, over the past couple of uh, weeks or months is, is actually the, um, the situation with Uber and some of the new information that's come out of that. You know, it's partly a function of teams that weren't necessarily in alignment with, with what constituted the rules of the program and indeed the same for the researcher. And th these are solvable things. They're easy mistakes to make, but they're all solvable. Very easy to do um, right if you're thinking about them ahead of time and just trying to avoid them. And the other thing that's really important from a communication standpoint, the hacker is the thing that's most important to them, I think, um, given the fact that they've been maligned for a really long time, is they, they actually are here to help. So what they don't want to feel like is that they're shouting into a black hole uh, that no one's on the other end of. So being responsive, making sure that you're actually doing that is a, is a really key, key piece and a, and a good tip there as well. It's not all about rewards. Um, but cash is king. Everyone's got to eat, right? So if you're going to run a financially incentivized disclosure program, you know, it's not about paying a ton of money for everything. You don't want to artificially inflate bug prices. But it is about working out what's economically rational to pay a researcher for the reward based on the risk that they've actually reduced within your organization. There's a bunch of stuff and consensus that we're actually working on bringing together with an open source project called the VRT where you know, those things are starting to normalize. Like this industry is very young still, but those patterns are just starting to emerge. So you know, as a general thesis, like pay fast and pay well, um, but apply a rational thought to, to how you're paying. Don't just cram liquidity out to the crowd for the sake of it. There's a balance that you can drive. And try to go on the high side, because that's going to attract them back to do more work with you. Um, and also beware of success bias. I think you hear a lot of stories in the press around you know, the $30,000 bug or the $50,000 bug or whatever else. Like, they're fantastic, and I love it when that happens. They're also in the very, very, very small minority um, if you look at you know, the overall distribution of payouts that happen. Uh, so our average payout across the industry last year was $500, but our largest payout was $50,000. That's an example of what I'm talking about. So you know, don't feel peer pressure, but again, pay fast, pay well. Try to encourage them to come back. And the fourth is seek counseling. Get advice. Um, you know, obviously, that's something that there's self-interest in that, in that comment, um, because that's really what we do. We've built out a platform and a team to help people do this. But you don't, you don't need to get it from Bug Crowd. I think you know, the call to action that I, that I wanted to put together for, uh, for the end of this conversation is, if everyone can raise your hands who is running a vulnerability disclosure or bug bounty program right now, Right, so everyone who's not raising their hand, take a look around, put it back up for a sec, take a look around at the people who are, and go have a chat to them. Just find out their experience of what this looks like, find out what the pitfalls are, see if they're gonna you know, call bollocks on some of the advice that I've given or if they think it's right, um, and work together as peers, because as I said, I firmly believe that this is something that we're all gonna have to figure out how to do through the course of our career, so it's a good time to start. And that's it.